We are recording the interview of James Nelson. This interview is being conducted by Katie Bradshaw from the Wright State University Veteran Voices Project. Also in attendance is Mike Nelson. This interview is being recorded at the Iowa Veterans Home in Marshalltown, Iowa. It is 10.54 a.m. on November 25th, 2019. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I believe you would like to go by Jim for the purpose yeah. of this interview. That would be nice. Thank you for allowing us to be here today. Sure. All right, Jim, would you like to tell us about when and where you were born? Oh, I was born in Webster City, Iowa, their hospital there. And uh, back in uh, October 1st, 1946. So I was born just after the war was over. That's about. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then you were the first of the children in the family. Yeah, yes, I'm the first of eight. And so, second, who came second? Uh, then I had my brother Art, and my sister Louise, my sister Rose, my sister Eileen, uh, my sister Mike, and <laughs> my, my brother Mike. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. And <laughs> my my brother Merlin and uh, my sister Debbie. So I had a lot of siblings. <laughs> you had a lot of sisters. Yes, <laughs> I had four of each. Did that balance out pretty well in the household? Well, actually, it did. I think so. I think it was about. As even as you're gonna get. Right. Uh, what did your parents do while you were growing oh, up? My mom was, uh, she was mostly having children, and my dad was a farmer in Renwick, Iowa. And um, he raised corn and soybeans mostly. And, uh, we also had raised hay for our cows. We had cows and pigs and oh, we had about every farm animal you could think of on our farm there. So, uh, Did you enjoy growing up on a farm? Oh, it was okay. Uh, oh, I would have liked it better if I hadn't had to work so much, but we were just kind of <coughs> hard men for our dad. Uh, we we got to do all the chores and all the work around the place. We got to do a lot of it. Uh, we got to bail a lot of hay and straw. And um, we we did that all summer long, seemed like. Yeah, how did you balance during the school year with school and working on the farm? Oh, well, we just went to school. Then when we, when we got home, we went to work. So it was just mostly... Uh, you're very busy. Yeah, we 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 knew we had to work when we got home, so that's what we did. Yeah, were you able to be in sports as well at school? Uh, no, I never was, um, except for uh, during junior high, I played football and basketball and baseball. I liked sports a lot, but I didn't get to my, my dad would let me play when I was in high school. He didn't want me getting busted up, so. Okay. Um, what was your favorite part of high, your high school years? Oh, I would say I was in the band and uh, I probably liked that the most. I played trombone and uh, 
after I got out of high school, I took up playing the guitar. I played guitar for quite a year, quite a few years. Then when I had my stroke, I can't, I can't move this left hand anymore, so I can't play guitar anymore. Mm. So that was probably the my most favorite thing in school. Well, so when after school, what did you do after high school? Uh, I started going to college right away. I went initially. I went to a college called Waldorf College. It was kind of a junior college. I went there two years. Then I transferred to the University of Northern Iowa. And I went there two years. What did you get your degree in? Oh, I got I got a degree in history, non-teaching history. So uh, it was during the uh, Vietnam era, and I was afraid I was going to get drafted into the army. So I wanted to hurry up and get my degree. Because I, I guess I thought I would never have a chance to finish going to college if I went to, if I went to the army, and uh, so I just uh, Waldorf College was a Lutheran college, and I got I came out of uh, Waldorf College with a lot of hours. Uh, that transferred as history hours. So I had more hours of history than anything else. So I just, I got, I took that as my major and that's what I graduated with as a major. <clears throat> Why did you choose the non-teaching route of history? Oh, uh, that's the only way I could get my degree and uh, graduate with a graduate with a degree. So okay, you didn't have a desire to be a history teacher to. Oh, uh, that's what I initially was gonna do was be a, a like a high school history teacher, but um, uh, tell you the truth, I'd really after after a while I. I didn't really want to do that anymore, so uh, I just wanted to get a degree. That was that was the important thing. You just want to get a degree because then you can get a job. A lot of job, a lot of jobs you could just if you've got a degree you could just apply, and if you've got a degree you got a good chance of getting the job. So that's what I did. Yeah, that seems to be you're showing you're competent yeah. to accomplish that so you can learn any kind of yeah, job, really. Right. Yeah. Right. So yeah. so were you also thinking then that maybe if you got drafted, you could be an officer as opposed to enlisted? Oh, no, I really didn't care about that. Uh, uh, although, when I was over in Korea, they were going to... Uh, they were going to send me to ROTC when my uh, enlistment, if I re-upped, they'd send me to OCS, Officer Candy School, and uh, I, I wish now I'd have done that, but uh, it's no big deal, I guess. Uh, I just wanted to get out of the Army and uh, so that's what I did. Okay, so how did it come, um, how did you find out that you were being drafted once you had finished college? I got a letter from the, uh, I got a letter from the Army. Did it arrive at your parents' home or at your college address? Well, I think, yeah, I believe it, uh, it came to my college address. I believe that was how it was. Okay, so the government knew you're finishing up and yeah, we're going to grab you. Yeah, well, it's the way Iowa draft worked uh, was the, 
county that you were from had track of you and they knew uh, that I was somehow they, I suppose the college let them know that I was, dra I was graduating and so they could draft me and they did. Okay. Uh, yeah, they they had to draft as many people as they could uh, eligible. So, how did you feel when that letter arrived? Not, well, actually, I felt pretty good. I had about a, <laughs> I had about half a fifth of whiskey in me. <laughs> <laughs> that helped you cope with the news. Yeah. <laughs> So how did you tell your parents that your letter had arrived? Oh, uh, I don't even remember. I suppose that I just called them on the telephone and told them. Yeah. Do you remember leaving for basic training? Yeah. Um, well, I... Yeah, I was sent down to the... Army, I uh, think the recruiting station in Des Moines, and then uh, that night I got on, I got on a transport plane with the other people that got drafted, and we flew to uh, uh, Louisiana, and. I was bused to Fort Polk, Louisiana that same day, so at least I didn't have a, I did have a long bus ride, I just had a long plane ride right down the middle of the United States. We, uh, we went right down the Mississippi River and I, I remember seeing all kinds of cities on the left and right of the plane as we were going down. We could see all the lights of the cities. It was... That was the first time I'd ever been on a plane, so... It was kind of neat. So excitement along with the nerves. Yeah. Well, once you got to basic training, what did you think of the process? Did you, did you find it difficult to adjust to or pretty oh. easy? Uh, yeah, it was pretty... I uh, I didn't have to work much harder than I did at home, so it it didn't didn't bother me much. I was uh, I could put up with about anything they threw at me. So farm work got you ready for the army. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, in in your time in basic training, is do you have any memories that really stand out? Oh yeah, I remember that I uh, I lost a lot of weight. I remember that um, and that was a good thing. I've always had trouble all my life with my weight, so uh, they. Of course, basic training, they have you doing all kinds of crazy exercises, climbing around on stuff and uh, doing all kinds of different exercises and stuff. And, and you got in pretty good shape. Did you meet some good friends while you were in basic training? Oh, I met some guys. We. We were friends, but nothing lasting, I guess, you'd say. So from basic training, um, how did you find out what your job was going to be? Oh, well, when uh, at the end of basic, they assigned you to uh, what they call AIT, Advanced Infantry Training. And all that I happened to, a lot of people got shipped all over the United States to different training facilities. I got shipped across the fort to another uh, 
infantry uh, unit, and I just had another what what it amounted to was another nine weeks of infantry training or basic training. It was so I had like a, a total of. 18 weeks of infantry training. Okay, because basic training felt a lot like yeah, the same a sort of training. AIT was just like basic training. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so your AIT, you went for infantry. Yes. And then from there, did you get assigned to a base or deployed? Yeah, I got, I got sent to Korea after that. I got, uh, I got to go home for a... Uh, I think it was a 30-day uh, vacation, and then then I was sent to Korea. When you went home, I imagine all of your little brothers and sisters were happy to see you. Oh, yeah. You bet. So did your dad put you straight to work on the farm, or did you get to go have a pretty good time seeing all your friends? Well, I was married at the time, so I got to see my wife. That was the most important thing to me, and uh, I, I really can't remember anything I did. Um, I think I spent most of my time over at my wife's, wife's parents' place. Okay, was she staying with her parents while you were away? Yeah. That must have been very difficult to find out then that you were going to Korea with yeah. since you were married. Yeah. It wasn't the ideal thing. Um, she ended up staying with her sister in Waterloo. Or she was going to... She was going to going to college at UNI. We're going there together. And um, I got drafted when I graduated from college. And then she stayed with her sister while I was in the Army. Okay, that must have been really difficult. Yeah. That adds a lot of yeah. longing for home then to the situation. Yeah, that's for sure. How long had you been married by the time you left? Oh, it was six months, mm. something like that. Okay. Okay, so that so then when you were leaving for Korea, I imagine that was a pretty difficult goodbye. Yeah. I don't even remember it. So when you were when you arrived in Korea, then. Um, how was that process? Oh, they sent us to a, a place they called a, a replacement depot, a repo depot is what they called it. And from there they assigned you to a unit as a replacement. So I was sent to the first of the 31st and they they evidently needed a secretary, so I I ended up being sent there as a as a clerk in battalion headquarters. So actually, it was a pretty good job, and uh, that's where I spent all my time. Then was as a, as a Typist, basically, in the first of the thirty-first infantry uh, uh, infantry unit. They they were uh, that unit was they were guarding missile bases. Is what they what they did, and uh, we were. Um, We just kind of moved from place to place. Uh, when I first got there, they were out in the field. So I was, uh, 
I lived for about four months in a big squad tent and uh, they they put our bunk beds in the in the uh, squad tent and I remember that the the ground was kind of a little mushy and the the, the bed sunk into the ground down to the it's, it's uh, sunk right up to the first bed oh and wow then the bunk bed yeah it was so there wasn't a tarp on the floor they just no. put it on dirt yes oh wow yeah did any of them tip over oh yeah we had uh we had kind of like monsoon rains that had that had uh kind of flood the tents so you have to you have to wait till the till the rain quit and then you'd have to rebuild your tent mm. or gather all your stuff back <laughs> it was yeah it was so you'd get done working your shift and have to go work to repair your living space yeah, that that had happened. And it uh, the well, it was okay most of the time. It's just when it rained, it made a mess. Yeah. So, did your degree help you get the job as the secretary then? Well, that's the only thing I can think of. So that worked out good then. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, I think what the deal was, I, uh, when you're drafted, they give you, uh, uh, intelligence test, and I had, a score, a high score on the intelligence test, and so I think that's probably what, what happened there. The... As it turned out, I went to work with the guys that assigned me to their battalion headquarters. So evidently they wanted a need to somebody that could type. And they uh, they checked each person they were assigning they had a had their intelligence score on their sheet so I just assumed they they saw I had a high score so they assigned me to work in their office uh, I lucked out I guess yeah did they have to do a security clearance on you then they did eventually I did I did have very high clearance I had a uh, I can't even remember. It was like the bottom clearance. Maybe just secret. That's usually the basic. Oh, uh, it's even lower than that. Hmm. A little confidential. I okay. Think. Okay. That's the kind of clearance I had. Was, uh, and I don't even know why I had that. I, uh, I did a, 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 occasionally handle secret documents, but nothing I ever got to look at. It was like secret orders that were came in for the colonel of the battalion or something like that. I, but I never got to read any of it. So. Okay, how was your communication back home while you were in Korea? Oh, it was really pretty good. Uh, I could uh, pick up a pick up a phone and call home. So uh, it was. It was pretty good, I guess you'd say. Uh, and I wrote a lot of letters. Um, that's what I, that's what I did at night. A lot of the time was write letters. So a lot of that. I imagine those are really appreciated. Oh yeah. 
So you would write home to your to your family, your folks and stuff, and then you'd also write home to your wife? Yes. Uh, mostly I'd write to my wife, but I'd write, I'd write to my folks too. Were you ever able to send some photos home that maybe you had taken? Uh, I remember sending uh, tapes that I'd recorded. I did that, and uh, pictures. I think I sent some pictures also. Did you also receive tapes? Yes. Yeah, I don't know whatever happened to those, but. During your time in Korea, was there kind of a middle point where you were able to come home and visit, or did you not get to? Oh, uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I was just walking out the door when my officer that I worked for would, uh, stopped me from going. I was just about ready to get on the plane, and uh, uh, so he said I... Uh, well, basically, I was too valuable to go, and uh, so I, I just stayed where I was at. That must have been very disappointing. Yeah, well... It was hard to let my wife know that I was going to come. Yeah. So then you, you, like a good soldier, readjusted your mind. Oh, uh, yeah, you don't have a choice. You know. As far as the, um, the living while you were there, so you're in a, do in a tent situation that was pretty uh, difficult. And to start with. To start with. And then we moved to a, uh, a regular base. That was mostly Quonset huts, and uh, for, we stayed there for about four months, and then we moved to the DMZ. With that was, they they have permanent bases up there, where they uh, they keep uh, U.S. infantry units, uh, and I was there for about four months. And they, they were basically, well, if you know what a Quonset hut is, it's a, just a kind of a steel building, and it had a, they were cold and drafty, I remember that. They had a, one stove in the, in the Quonset hut to keep it warm. And as long as you get get into your bed and get a lot of blankets over you, you're all right. How many people would be in a Quonset hut? Oh, let's see. About 20. Was it just one big room? Uh, basically, yeah. Uh, what about um, the food? How did you adjust to the food in Korea? Oh, it was just like U.S. They had the army. They evidently they print uh, one menu for the whole army, and that's what you get. None of us are good. <laughs> It was, yeah. Flavorless? Yeah. <laughs> did you go out into the community to eat ever? Oh, yeah, I did one time, I remember. We got a, it's kind of a sample meal of what they have, and I didn't like it either. <laughs> uh, this kind of thing now, there's, a lot of Korean uh, restaurants popping up over, all over the place, and uh, I knew what kimchi was before, 
before they had it in the United States. You didn't like it? Most nasty stuff. <laughs> do you like normal sauerkraut? Like German sauerkraut? Yeah, I do. Okay, because I like kimchi more than German sauerkraut. Oh, yeah. That's... No, I... Well, the, the funny thing was that we had a bunch of Korean soldiers that stayed with our unit. They were called Katusas. And they would uh, they would go to their their clubhouse or whatever it was. Called it the Katusa Club, and they they drink and eat kimchi. And there's a nasty stuff, nasty smelling stuff, and uh, we could always tell when they'd be on a binge. And I suppose you associate that smell even now, if you were to smell it to that time, that was oh, yeah. not very ideal in your I'm life. I'm sure. <laughs> I never, never smelled it since. That's a good thing. <laughs> Do you have any memories um, in Korea that you would like to share that really stand out? Um, I remember once uh, I was, for some reason, I was work, work late and all of a sudden somebody came running in and told us that somebody had shot their company commander and they evidently was high or drunk or one or the other and got into it with his company commander and he shot his company commander and they had to medevac the commander uh, out to uh, a mash unit which was Oh, about 40 miles away, and then uh, they they took the guy, the black guy, and he they sent him off to prison or something. And, uh, that was that was a. Uh, I I stayed on the job that night till about nine o'clock at night, I suppose, and no, and there wasn't any real reason for me to do that, but I thought maybe I might be useful. And um, they they had helicopters come flying in and out, taking people here and there, and. Um, I was, uh, the guy was, I think the guy was on drugs, and he had a problem with his commander, and he got, settled it. He went out on a, they had him go out on a, some, current, some kind of, uh, Uh, some kind of, uh, I, it was some kind of raid, uh, it was a training mission or something. He ended up getting his hands on a, on a, on a, on a weapon maybe? A weapon with live ammunition and Wow. Never, they never let us have live ammunition for uh, most of the army I saw in the States. They'd give you a weapon, but they'd never give you any ammunition for it. You'd, well, you'd walk guard duty and you'll have the weapon, but you have no bullets for it. So. <laughs> 
that's how it was when I was in Korea. We well, had to carry the M16 around, but we didn't have any weapons. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or, I mean, any bullets. <laughs> uh -huh. Thankfully, that would have been more stressful, I think, uh -huh. if Where were you there had been. Where you in Korea? Um, in Al Jabber was the base. Al Jabber. And so it was inside of a Kuwaiti base was then the U.S. base. And it had been set up during Desert Storm, but uh -huh. then I went right before the 9-11, or the Iraq invasion kicked off. Well, you were in so. the uh, Near East. Yeah, but it was it was before the Iraq invasion, so we still got to go into town and eat, you know, food from around the world and do some shopping and the the fun time, not the stressful time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I got to have a good experience in Kuwait, and that's not most people's story. Yeah, really? Yeah. Yeah. So then um did the did the um did he survive the guy who got shot? Oh I don't really know. Okay. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if he was hurt bad or not. I know that they medevaced him out to a, a hospital and that's all I ever heard of it. Yeah. They, they never talked about it or anything after that, so. Okay. While you were in Korea, did you make some good friends? Uh, yes. Uh, I had, oh, probably half a dozen guys I knew in my unit that I was, uh, I was in a tent with uh, the battalion headquarters people. Uh, I was... Um, I was in S1, which is like personnel, and uh, I knew a lot of people that were in S2 that were, uh, that was like security or that kind of thing. And I knew people in S4 that was, uh, supply and Most of the, those guys. Were you able to stay in contact with some of them after returning home? Yeah, I called. A, I knew a guy in, uh, in fact, his name was Terry Best. He was from Minneapolis. I called him and asked him what he was doing. He left probably a few weeks before I did. And so he was in, he was back home and I think I, had, I think I had his phone number and I gave him a call and, and I, I think that's the only one I remember calling. I imagine that transition coming home is pretty difficult. Oh no, I was glad to get back. Okay, well that's good. <laughs> uh, yeah. So how did that go? How did your homecoming go? Um, how did you find out that it was time for you to come home? Well, you knew yeah, you have a date on your record, I think it's called your d -Rose, that you knew the exact date you were leaving. And um, so when that day came, you, they got, got you, uh, they shipped you out and uh, Funny thing, I got sent down. I ended up being sent to the airport. I was going to be flown over to Japan, and um, the their planes were all full, and I couldn't get a couldn't get a ride over, and took I. I remember staying up all day, day and night, make sure they didn't leave me behind. And I got a ride, like a ride the next day, uh, jet over, over to Japan. I remember we flew in to a airport that's all right, 
that built out into the sea and we landed over the water and on the runway. It was pretty cool. <laughs> Was that, were you nervous, hoping he would hit the runway? No. <laughs> like hoping he wouldn't miss it? <laughs> yes. Well, I was glad to be on solid ground, I'll say that. Then when we're going, we're taking off, we're going to do a, a single, a one solid flight from Japan to Port Louis, Washington. And um, it was a long flight. I was dead tired. And uh, I remember we took off and, and I think they had, they came back and had to work on the plane because it wasn't quite right. Finally we took off and flew back. We flew over the entire Pacific Ocean, water all the way, and um, landed at uh, Port Louis, Washington, or somewhere out there on the West Coast. I Anyway, I was sent to Port Louis, Washington. That's where I got out of the Army. So you did not go home first, you went straight to... Yeah, Fort Lewis. We went, went to Port Louis and got out there. And then they and I caught a flight uh, out of Port Louis to I think it was Waterloo, Iowa, and uh, one one long one long final flight across the Pacific, and one long flight from Fort Louis to Waterloo, Iowa. I was tired to fly, and I remember that. I imagine. Yeah. Were you able to out-process at Fort Lewis pretty quickly? Well, yeah, not bad. Uh, you know, you have your normal army bullshit. Uh, you know, they 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 can't resist they can't resist messing with you, so. Um, Yeah, I don't even remember. All I can remember is that I went into a room once and it was, um, evidently they were, it was all, all full of, it, had, it was full of a great big heap of our army uh, camouflage boots from Vietnam soldiers, a whole great big room full of shoes, and uh, I was kind of surprised about that. What was that about? Uh, that was just where they took, evidently they were sorting them or something, and uh, trying to find the ones that weren't all shot, I suppose. Well, now if the army was was having them returned, was that maybe soldiers out processing, leaving them behind that yeah. they didn't want them? Uh, no, I would say it's more the army was taking them back because you would have never had any say as to keeping them or not. Okay. I, I don't think. Well, you hear a lot of really difficult stories of people coming home from uh, the Vietnam War. Yeah. Did you experience no, any of that? No, I didn't have any hard times getting it back, getting back. I just, once I could get a flight out of Japan, I it was far, far. It was fine. I remember that when I got back into uh, Fort Polk, I requested a, a long distance line so I could call my wife. And I got to call and talk to her, tell her I was back. And uh, 
guitar. I was flying out like the next day, coming back to Iowa. So. So then, did she pick you up at the airport in Waterloo? Yeah, she did. Uh, yeah, it was her and my uh, sister and brother-in-law picked me up at the airport. I remember that we. Uh, went out someplace and had a prime rib. <laughs> I thought that was a good deal. <laughs> After all that bland food in Korea. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. So was she still living with her parents? No, oh, she was living with her brother and sister-in-law. Okay, so then you moved in, in into your brother and sister-in-law's yeah, house? Yeah, I did. Did you come back and uh, where did you start working when you got back? Oh, I, um, <clears throat> when I was drafted, I was working for uh, a company called uh, Central States Theaters Incorporated. They were, uh, they owned a lot of the theaters in Iowa. And I worked at a theater, a drive-in in Waterloo, called the Starlight Drive-In Theater. And uh, I went back back to, to work at that place. And they gave me a job as an assistant manager there. And I was assistant manager at the uh, theater for almost oh, probably four or five months and then they they gave me I was a manager of the ranch driving theater in Ames Iowa so I moved from Waterloo to Ames and then they uh, Then they made me manager of the Clinton Drive-In Theater in Clinton, Iowa. And I was there for a couple of years. And uh, I quit at that place. And I moved back to uh, Waterloo. And I was there for Well, I went back to work for, at the Starlight Driving Theater for, uh, I don't know what it was. Then I went, I moved from the Starlight back to the Ranch Driving Theater in Ames. And I worked there for a couple of years. Were you a movie buff? Is that part of what made you interested in those jobs? Oh, no, I just need some money. Just a job to be. Uh, I did get to watch a lot of movies, though. <laughs> you always knew what was out and popular, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I went to the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> Did you end up getting a chance to use your degree in history? No, I never did. Uh, I just, I just wanted to make sure I had a degree. Um, if you have a degree, you can apply most any place. So you eventually ended up working at Winnebago yeah. in Forest City. Yeah. Did did you end up back there because you'd attended college those first few years in uh, Forest City? Yes. I uh I as a matter of fact I worked for Winnebago while I was in college in Forest City. And uh Yeah, I went uh I mean, I think I quit the whatever theater I was running at the time and 
went to work at, uh, was lucky to get a job at Winnebago and uh, I spent probably the first six months I was in, uh, when at Winnebago, I was building Winnebago's. I worked on the assembly line and uh, from there I got a I got a job as a computer a computer operator. I did that for about two years and then I got a job as a computer programmer and I did that for oh probably fifteen years at at Winnebago and from there uh, I got Winnebago is a funny place. Uh, they're like a lot of other uh, factories. They, they hire a whole bunch of people when they need them. Then they fire them all. And that's what happened to me is I got laid off. And uh, after that I got a job with uh, the Lamar's Mutual Insurance Company over in Lamar's, Iowa. And uh, I was a computer programmer and I did that for about 10 years and then they wanted to uh, install a, a computer network, so I was put in charge of installing that, and uh, I worked for a guy that was a uh, He was the head of uh, systems at Mars Mutual, and uh, I was, uh, well, I had some title, no, a network uh, administrator or something like that. And uh, I spent my time putting computers together and Oh, uh, I, uh, I installed personal computers for everybody at the company there, over a hundred personal computers, and, uh, and we put a, put in a network and hooked, a, hooked them all together and and so that, that's what I did, that's what I was doing when I, um, I was talking to my boss one day, I, I said, geez, I don't feel very good, I'm, I think I better go home, and, and, uh, I did, I went out, jumped in my truck and went home and the neat thing was my my boss didn't think I looked very good. He followed me home and came and knocked on my door. I answered the door and op I opened the door and fell down oh. and uh, I think that's when I had my stroke. So he called the ambulance and I got taken to the hospital and they started working on me and um, I think I spent the next four weeks in the hospital, something like that. That's a long time. Yeah. Uh, they sent me from the Lamar's Hospital to Des Moines. Uh, it's, they have a 
rehabilitation unit called uh, Yonkers and they had me there for a month or two and, and uh, I was in pretty good shape when I left there and um, then after that I get sent home and I've been sitting around ever since. <laughs> so that's when retirement began? Yes, I retired at age 56. Okay. So, so you were in the computer industry, like the private, um, right. like personalized computer industry very early on. Oh yeah, when it first started it up. Is it amazing to you where computers are now in comparison? Uh, no, because I, my first 15 years of computers, I worked on great big IBM computers, and they were great big machines, you know, and, uh, and we thought the uh, personal computers were just kind of Not not real computers, kind of like, like a toys. toy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Could you have imagined then the internet and oh, smartphones? No. no, I know it's. I mean, now you have uh, smartphones, which are basically little computers and uh, tablets. I've even got a tablet. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah. I, uh... Were you able to stay involved with um, computers once you retired uh, as a hobby? Yeah, I, uh, I got a big computer right behind you. That's a very nice screen. Yeah. And I see there's a webcam. Do you chat with some people? I did at one time. I don't I don't have it running anymore. Mm. I used uh, what's that one program? Skype. Skype. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I used I had a guy in here in IBH. I used to Skype all the time and uh, we did that for a couple of years and. It's pretty cool. I use, I use it to call Eileen every once in a while. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I use it to call him. Unfortunately, he died. Uh, but yeah, it it's the. They use Skype here in IVH for talking to nurses at different hospitals. I talked to uh, nurses at the VA hospital in Des Moines several times. With Skype, that's amazing. With Skype, yeah. They they have kind of a, a computer unit they put together for uh, using Skype to call people at the VA hospital in Des Moines. Have you had that a couple of times? That must save um, people traveling a long distance when they don't really need to be seen in person if it can be done uh, over Skype. Yeah, I've, a lot of that is they just want to talk to you, you know, and it takes a couple hours to drive down to Des Moines, and then you gotta I used to get uh for a while they i had uh tests that showed I might have cancer, so they had me go to the VA hospital in Des Moines for tests. And uh, 
I used to have to go to uh, the oncology lab, they call it. If you ever get stuck with oncology, what it means is cancer. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you didn't have cancer? Didn't have. Oh, that's Thank good. Thank God I didn't yeah. have cancer. Yeah. So you've been here at the Iowa Veterans Home for about 10 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How has your experience been here? Oh, it's not bad, not bad. It's a nice big room you have. Yeah, it's, it's bigger than most rooms. Bigger than the rooms I had before I moved into it. Um, well, Mike remembers where I used to be. It was about half the size of this. And when I first came here, uh, I had I lived in a room with one other guy. So, and we had a room about this big, but it was split in two. He had half and I had half, so. It's nice to have your own space. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So I saw when we came in, they have a lot of different activities here. Oh. Are there some that you're involved in? Oh, uh, no, not really. Uh, I, they go, go on quite a few trips. I, I do that all the time. Okay. You usually uh, they uh, they got they go out to restaurants a lot. I like doing that. I go over to uh, what's the place in Ames? Uh, that big one. Yes. I know Hickory what you're. House? Yeah, is it Hickory House? Yeah, Hickory Park. Hickory yeah. Park. Yes. Um, yeah, we go over there all the time. I like that real well. And uh, there's a a uh, barbecue joint here in town I like. And I'll go every every place but uh, fish. <laughs> I don't like fish. So. Do you guys have any kind of um, veteran groups here that meet, or? Oh, they do, but they're like, uh, um, Alcoholics Anonymous. And okay. <laughs> things like that. Yeah. And then your cousin Nancy is also here in this yeah, home, she right? Yeah, is. She lives on the floor above me on, uh, Yeah, she's in the middle of the hall, right above me. And that must be nice to have a family member. Yeah, yeah that is. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay, Jim, do you feel like there's anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to share? Oh, no, we probably uh, probably gone through all the dirty details. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, one last question for you. Sure. What advice would you leave to future generations? Oh. I would say that the best financial fi advice I can give people is don't get involved with stock market. Uh, I I had money in two different stock market uh, what do they, they call them? Funds or Roth IRAs or No they were actually I had, stocks? I had stocks. Okay. And uh, I lost all my money in Mm. And uh, when I left, when I left Winnebago, I had, I got a, 
401k distribution and I, inv I invested it with Harper Jaffrey and the guy there that I invested it with uh, bought stocks in gold. Well, he had gold. Basically, I owned a bunch of gold stocks that went bad and I lost all my money and mm. he did it all without my knowledge and um, then I had uh, <coughs> I had another 401k distribution when uh, it was another stock market place I invested it and it was back during the 2008 the recession recession and I lost uh, a lot of money then and so then I uh, I uh, pulled all the money out of that and I invested it in a uh, 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 it's uh, like a mutual fund that uh, it, it finishes when I'm 75. Okay. That's a uh, I can't even remember. Like a term? I'm trying to think what, what phrase would be used mm. for that. So so when you turn 75, you will get that money then? Right. Okay, uh, that's good. Yeah. That's good. The problem is, uh, <laughs> when I came in here, they get all my money. Everything I have, they get, they get all my Social Security, and I had some uh, military uh, medical funds that I get on a regular basis, and they get all that. That's, okay. That's how I pay, pay to stay in here. Yeah. So if you get this payout at 75, do they get that money as well? Yes. Um, oh, wow. Mm. So I... I don't know what I'm going to do about that. But, okay. Um, yeah, essentially I'm in here and... I get $140 a month. Okay. Uh, that's what I get. But they get from the money that I get from the government. They get whatever I have coming. To pay to take care of you, to cover yes, to take care uh, of you. Yeah. Well, I would imagine you have a better setup than a lot of people have. Oh, yeah. So that's good. I'm, I'm not... I'm pretty well off compared compared to most people. I'd say most people in rest homes and that kind of thing. Yeah. I'm, I probably got a better. Uh, I mean, just just every month they take us all kinds of places, and you know, I get to I get to go to a lot a lot of places more than I would uh, if I was staying at home. Yeah, and the building is beautiful. This oh, looks like yeah. such a nice facility. Yeah, it is really nice. That's good. Okay, well, we'll, we'll oh, did you, is there anything else that you wanted to add? Uh, not that I can think of. All right. This concludes our interview with James Nelson. Thank you for your time today, and thank you for your military service. Sure.